This is Chapter 5, Dimensional Analysis and Similarity, Part 5. In the previous video, you saw some dimensionless numbers or dimensionless parameters that arose in the field of heat transfer, convective heat transfer. In this video, I'm going to discuss the common dimensionless parameters that arise in fluid mechanics. Now, of course, you've already seen the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is widely applicable in fluid mechanics, and it determines whether a flow transitions from laminar to turbulent flow, for instance. And most problems where fluid is moving, the Reynolds number will be important. There's also the Mach number. We talked about this, I think, in Chapter 1. It has to do with compressible flows. There's something called the Froude number which has to do with free surface flows. Here I show a boat being towed in a test tank. There's another number called the Weber number when surface tension effects are important. And yet another number called the Struhall number when you have oscillating flows like the vortex street behind a cylinder or the oscillation of the, the bridge at Tacoma Narrows. And so these parameters are used to characterize laminar and turbulent flows, compressible flows, open channel flows, uh, flows with strong surface tension effects, and oscillating flows. So let's start with the Reynolds number and tell you a little bit more about the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number can be written in this form. Of course, it's, it's rho v l. l is some characteristic dimension typically the pipe diameter, if you're dealing with a pipe, over dynamic viscosity. You can show that this is equal to the inertia force in the fluid divided by the viscous force in the fluid. And it, as I mentioned, it's widely applicable in fluid dynamics problems. Whenever you have a flowing fluid, the Reynolds number is going to be important in terms of determining the behavior in the flow. And you've seen this already. You know that when the Reynolds number is very low, you get Stokes flow. Viscous forces dominate, and the forces due to the fluid acceleration, those convective acceleration terms are small, and you saw this in lab number one, where you dropped spheres into oil, and you obtained Stokes flow. Then in lab number two, you saw that the Reynolds number determines transition from laminar to turbulent flow in a pipe, and this has some big implications for the heat transfer in the pipe and the pressure loss in the pipe. So you've seen Reynolds number. There's a number of other parameters that are important in other types of fluid mechanics problems. So I want you to have some familiarity with them. There's the Mach number. We ran across this, I think, in chapter one. The Mach number is the speed of the flow over the speed of sound. In a gas, that would be the square root of KRT. And we talked about how, how the Mach number determines whether or not you have compressible flow. So when the Mach number is greater than 0.3, you have compressible flow, and the density is not a constant in a gas, and so the Mach number in addition to the Reynolds number would be important for characterizing the flow, for obtaining similarity, for example. And there's a number of applications here. I've shown a picture here of a small model that's been launched at a Mach number of 1.1. So it's important for supersonic flight. You can see the shock waves here coming off. This would be the bow shock, and this would be the stern shock. If you were nearby as this model passed by, or an aircraft going at supersonic speed, these represent very large pressure differences. And you'd hear a sonic boom, and as that pressure wave passed, uh, your ear. It's also important for military applications like rocket ballistics and uh, firing projectiles. Here, here's a projectile going up just slightly under the speed of sound, so Mach 0.98. These images are taken from the album of fluid motion. If you ever get a chance, you might want to take that out from the library. It's a very interesting book in terms of the pictures. And you can see the turbulent wake here too. There's another number that's quite important in a class of flows called the Froude number. The Froude number is important in open channel flows or in flows where you have a free surface. And the Froude number is the 
velocity of the fluid squared divided by gravity times distance. And you can show that this is equal to the inertia force in the fluid divided by the gravity force. And the Froude number is important for similarity in applications like Weir's. In fact, there's an entire chapter in your textbook, if you see chapter 10, which we're not going to do on, the performance of flow over Weir's. A Weir is an obstruction in a in a channel flow, and by measuring uh, the height of the fluid, you can actually determine the flow rate over the, over the weir. It's important for modeling river flows, for determining things like floods and tsunami predictions. It's really important for measuring the drag on the hulls of ships, and I've shown a picture here of a boat being towed through a water channel, and of course there'd be a load cell here to measure the drag, and you'd run this experiment at the same Froude number as the full-scale ship, and you should get the same behavior of the free surface. The wave here, the bow wave, would look the same at the same Froude number. An interesting application of this is that modern ships, most modern ships have a bulbous bow that's just slightly below the waterline, so you may never have seen this before, and this greatly reduces the, the wave drag. I don't want to get too far into this because it's a little bit of an aside, but uh, it does relate to the free surface flows. Here's a picture of a ship with a hull going at, I don't know what the Froude number is, it's too bad it doesn't give you, but going at 18 knots. And you can see the, the, the disturbance, the bow disturbance here, the big wave that's generated, and that generates drag on the hull. And then what they've done is, this is running at the same 18 knots, it's the same ship, with the same gravity, so we'd have the same Froude number, and now, but now with a bulbous hull at the front. And you can really see the greatly reduced wave that comes off the bow, and this can result in as much as a 10 to 15 percent reduction in the drag on the boat and reduction in fuel consumption. So that's a nice interesting application. Of course, if you were testing a boat in a, in a small scale model, you'd run the the model at the same Froude number as the full-scale ship to predict the drag on the, on the hull. Another number that comes up in fluid mechanics is called the Weber number. It comes up whenever you have a flow with an interface between two surfaces like water and air, so in multi-phase flows. And in these kind of flows, surface tension is important. So the Weber number which is rho v squared l, l again is some characteristic dimension, might be the diameter of a droplet, over the surface tension. And we talked about surface tension in chapter one. And so it's inertia forces over surface tension forces. And it has important applications if you're looking at multi-phase flows where liquid droplet effects, liquid film effects, and capillary effects are important, such as spray painting or inkjet printing. And I found this really interesting video on YouTube of experiments that were done in microgravity, so in near zero g. It didn't say in the video, but I'm pretty sure this was done in a parabolic arc flight. This is a jet that flies in parabolas to give short durations where you have essentially no gravity. So you get 30 seconds in the parabola where you get zero g, followed by another 30 seconds where you pull out and you pull two g. And what this video shows, let me just start it and I'll pause it. What we have here is two tubes or jets, if you like, jets of water pointing towards each other with water coming out. Now this is in zero gravity. And this is a quite low Weber number here. The Weber number is just 2.0. And it this Weber number, the surface tension force dominates, so the droplets can't detach from their, their nozzles. But if we go move ahead here and you let, so you'll see at this Weber number, you just get attached droplets. Now at just a slightly higher Weber number, 2.7, the droplets detach and the droplets, because of surface tension instability, they form uh, little droplets, which then bounce into each other, but they don't have enough momentum to coalesce. Now, at slightly higher Weber number, 
3.3, the droplets have enough momentum to coalesce into a single droplet. And then at still higher Weber number, we form this liquid bridge. And this video uh, is very interesting and it goes on and looks at other jets, oblique jets and things like that. I won't go on, but you get the idea that the, the amount of inertia that the uh, jet has relative to its surface tension uh, greatly determines the behavior. And this has a lot of interesting applications, uh, terrestrial applications, so applications in Earth's gravity as well. But the beauty of this video is that it was done in zero G, so we don't have the gravity force, we just have the inertia force interacting with the surface tension force. It's really quite, quite a beautiful video. But I'll stop there. I think you get the idea. Another important number in fluid mechanics is the Struhall number, and it's really a dimensionless frequency. It comes up in unsteady oscillating flows, and you've seen this in the vortex shedding, so-called von Karman vortex street behind a cylinder. You've also seen it in the oscillation of the, the bridge at Tacoma Narrows that ultimately destroyed the bridge. And it has important applications in flow-induced vibrations of structures and even things like hydrowires. If you get a high wind, uh, the hydrowires can start galloping or dancing and uh, cause failure of the, of the wire. And what you particularly want to do is you want to uh, avoid a frequency that is near the resonance because, you know, it doesn't take much of a force if it's applied at the resonant frequency, the amplitude builds up substantially. Now the Struhall number is omega over 2 pi. So the omega is a uh, frequency, again, a characteristic length. So it's the oscillation speed over the mean flow speed. So it's a dimensionless frequency. And I found a video here of vortex shedding from a cylinder at different Reynolds numbers. And I'll start it in a moment. What you'll notice is at low Reynolds numbers, you get very low oscillation frequency, the frequency of vortex shedding is low, and at 10 times, roughly 10 times higher the Reynolds number, we get much higher oscillation frequency. So I'll start the video. You can really see the, the low oscillation frequency at low Reynolds number and the high oscillation frequency at high Reynolds number. And in fact, when you characterize the unsteadiness using this parameter, you can plot the Stanton number versus Reynolds number, and you get almost a single curve here. So for cylinders, you can predict from this graph what the oscillation frequency is. And you would, if you were doing structural anal analysis, you want to make sure that it doesn't have a natural frequency uh, near the forcing frequency of the Stanton number. It's also important for other for other structures as well, not just, not just cylinders. Now your book contains a list of many common dimensionless parameters in fluid mechanics. This is table or part of table 5.2. And so we've talked about a lot of, about many of these, Reynolds number, Mach number, Fried number, Weber number. There are others which I haven't discussed. There's Struhall number down here. And the table goes on and on. There's a couple of others that you will see if you study natural convection, which is my research area. Uh, you get the Grashof number and Rayleigh number. We've talked about the drag coefficient in this course. It's the drag over the, this is the stagnation pressure times the frontal area. So it's like, if you like the stagnation force uh, that creates the drag coefficient. This, I should say too, that this table is just a partial list of uh, all of the dimensionless parameters in fluid mechanics. There's at least, I would say, 10 or 20 more that apply to more exotic situations. So now you should have some familiarity with uh, common dimensionless parameters in fluid mechanics. You're going to see them arise in uh, subsequent courses. I thought I'd end by showing a short YouTube video of a model boat being towed in a tank. This video shows the effect of Froude number on the, 
the wake, the bow wave that comes off the boat at two different frog numbers. And remember, the frog number is the inertia force over the gravity force. So let me just start the video. The first test is at a relatively low frog number, 0.155. That would be based on the length of the boat. And just look at the, the nature of that wave. It's a nice, smooth, fairly non-turbulent uh, wave coming off the boat. And then in a moment, it cuts to another test done a substantially higher frog number, about three times higher frog number. And you can see it's a much bigger uh, wave, much more turbulent, and would cause much more drag on the ship. So these tests would be done at the same frog number as the full-scale boat, and they could be used to predict the, the wave drag on the boat. And that completes this video.